Well, good evening, church family. Welcome back to Wisdom Wednesday, and tonight we are in Psalm 149. So I want to encourage you, make your way there if you have your Bibles with you, which I trust that you do. Um, Psalm 149. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about praise. This was a, a topic that was very near and dear to David's heart. We see him talk about it quite frequently throughout the, uh, throughout the Psalms. And we're going to see an expression used here tonight um, that David uses about six times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, throughout the course of the Psalms. And so, you know, we might kind of rehash some things that we've discussed before, but it's a wonderful reminder of, of how we should be continually uh, giving God praise for the things that he does in our life. So uh, before we jump in, as we always like to do, let's go ahead and ask the Lord to bless our time here together and to bless the reading, the hearing, the teaching, and the application of his word. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, as always, we just give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for every moment that we have, uh, Lord, to enjoy this world that you have created. We uh, we thank you for the way that you love us and sustain us. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that we have received in you. We thank you for all these things, Lord, the sustaining power of your word. And to that end, uh, Father, we just pray that you would lead us here at this time as we uh, open up the, our, our Bibles and Explore the words of these psalms. Uh, Lord, I pray that the words would leap from the page and, and find new life in our uh, our lives today, that we would uh, have new insight and understanding and, and seek new application. Uh, because, Lord, your word is just as true today as it has always been. So help us to, uh, to give it uh, new hands and feet and put some legs on it and put it into action in our lives uh, here today. We just pray that your Holy Spirit, as always, would be our interpreter. Uh, they would, he would help us to understand uh, what this looks like in our life. And um, most of all, Lord, we just want you to be glorified here at this time. Through it all, uh, through the reading of your word, through the, uh, the understanding, the study, uh, and then, of course, the, the application, Lord, we just want you to be glorified in our lives. And we just ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, again, Psalm 149, if you've made your way there, um, go ahead. I want to encourage you to read along. Uh, if you haven't or if you don't have your Bible handy, I'm going to put the words up on the screen. You can join me. Um, Psalm 149. Let's read this together. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and uh, punishments on the people. Peoples. Excuse me. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. So again, we see uh, immediately in this text, right, beginning and end, we see this, this notion of praise the Lord. We've seen this in other Psalms uh, where there's kind of a book-ended statement that really encapsulates where we're going with this. Now he follows up this first praise the Lord with that expression that I was referring to that David uses quite often. Um, we see it here, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, uh, again, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is used about six times throughout the Psalms. That's five or six times, one of those two there. But he uses it quite often. And uh, we're going to come back to this because that particular expression uh, has always been sort of near to my heart. I've always kind of jumped on that one. I really clung to that. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a powerful statement. And I think we need to, to talk about that a little more specifically. But I want to give that the time it deserves uh, towards the tail end of things. Let's continue on here. Again, coming back to, to verse 1 in just a little bit. Uh, his praise in the assembly of the godly, right? We should be singing to him a new song. We should be glorifying him uh, together among the assembly. Now, I want to point out something that we see kind of, not flip, but 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 augment uh, a little later on. So verse 1, hold on to that, right? We are to sing the Lord uh, to the Lord a new song among the assembly of the godly. Now, we're going to compare this to what we see a little later. Um, and this is going to be uh, in verse 5. Right down here where it says, Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment 
on the peoples. Now, I know we jumped ahead a little bit there, but what you see is this contrast of we should be glorifying God among the godly for one purpose and glorifying God among the unrighteous or the ungodly for a different purpose. But it's glorifying him all the same in both cases, right? Singing to him this new song, praising him in both cases. Uh, I just want to point out there, again, you, you see very specifically both instances in which we are to praise him. There's not a moment of our life in which God is not to be praised. He is certainly worthy of praise uh, in, in uh, for who he is and what he has done. I'm going to put this back up on the screen so we can look at this together. Um, again, so praise him in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his master. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and liar. So here David is, is uh, you know, a lot of this is kind of some poetic influence there. Um, it, this is not literally saying that these are the only methods that we have to give God glory, that you um, that you must literally be dancing and that you must literally be using instruments. Um, again, these, these are things that are commonly associated with um, times of jubilation and celebration. And, and so he's sort of painting this portrait here in this very poetic sense um, of us rejoicing together and just celebrating the, the good work that God has done. Um, it's, you know, probably also a good argument to make that David uses these because these were sort of his tools of the trade. Um, but I, I point that out just to say that, you know, if you're not uh, a dancer or if you're not a musical person, that doesn't mean that you can't praise God, right? You, you have your own way. You have uh, gifts and talents that God has given you. You have things about you um, that you can use to give him praise. These were, of course, just simply David's tools that he uses uh, and gives back to him, right? David, of course, danced before the Lord, and he was a musician. He, uh, you know, played these instruments. And so uh, he's speaking a little bit from personal experience and personal application. Um, so when you read that, don't interpret that as this is the only way that God can be glorified uh, or should be glorified. This is, uh, again, a very specific instance here. Um, and you can make the same argument again with that central passage that we're going to come back to, right? Sing to the Lord a new song. Um, we may not all consider ourselves uh, to be singers, right? But we'll talk about that a little later. Um, you can certainly apply it in however it applies in your life. Uh, the thing that we can all do is praise him. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Now, I want to hold on that one for just a minute. He adorns the humble with salvation. I love how this passage points out that humility comes with the gift of salvation. Salvation is one of those things where we could easily find ourselves becoming prideful because of it. Anytime there is blessing, anytime uh, that there is any sense of prosperity that we may have in our life, in whatever way that is, we can easily be tempted to become prideful. And start to think that because we have this gift, we are somehow better off than someone else. But here we're reminded that we are to be humble. Because the salvation that we have, we have received from God. It has been given to us, but we didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to receive it on our own. It was given to us. We need to stay humble to recognize truly who we are in light of who he is. So... Um, again, he adorns the humble uh, with salvation. Our humility is not uh, something that, again, we, we kind of just lament over and over and over. Um, our humility is the way in which we receive his blessings. Let's continue on with what he has to say here. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. The, the second half of this passage here, I think, is particularly of interest, right? Let them sing for joy on their beds. Well, what is this referring to? Well, typically when it refers to someone being on their beds, this was a time of sickness. This was a time of um, perhaps even referring to, you know, their deathbed, right? They're, they're sort of coming to that end of life in there. Let the godly exult in glory. During those dark times of life, during those difficult times of life, that is when we give glory back to God. I mean, we give it to him the whole way. Um, but even in those dark, dark moments, that is when we give him the most glory that he has. And so we sing for joy. That moment where sort of the, the jaws of death think that they have won, where death seems to think that it has claimed a victory, 
um, that is when we proclaim the victory of the Lord. Uh, and we, we see this here as it kind of continues in this passage. It's verse 6 here. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. Let me go ahead and put that back up on the screen so you can read this with me. Um, again, let me read that at verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. See, our testimony, our, our proclamation of God's glory is a two-handed sword, or a two-edged two sword, uh, rather, um, in which we can use that to, uh, to be a weapon, if you, if you will, right? Again, it, it mentions later to execute vengeance on the nation and punishments on the peoples. This, this return attack, right? So when it's talking about the people on their beds, these are those that have received uh, an attack from the world, whether it be through sickness or whatever it may be. This is the response that we have to say that though you have assaulted me, though the, the, um, you know, the enemy has, has come at me from every particular way, or every which way he can, he has not overcome me. This is our counterattack to say that you didn't win. You didn't win. I may be down, but I'm not out because I have received the salvation of the Lord. Even though I am, you know, humbled, right? And of course, we are humble ourselves, but, um, you know, we, we may have been assaulted uh, by the things of this world. This is our proclamation of victory. That two-edged sword that comes back, the praise that we have that comes back in, uh, in the midst of uh, opposition, in the midst of conflict, we can proclaim God's glory. And the scripture here tells us to execute vengeance on the nation, uh, nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. All of these rulers and, 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 and kings and uh, all of these people that would oppress others in this world. And again, it, what, what title they bear changes with culture and time and all of those things. But um, let's remember that it doesn't matter who it is, right? All of these people who may have thought that they were at the top of, of the food chain, that they were the absolute ruler of all things, they will all submit one day to our God. They will bow the knee and be judged for their actions. They will be judged for the way that they have treated others. And our testimony is a reminder to them that our God is more powerful than they could ever be. And here it talks about that judgment that, that will come and that they will receive. This is honor for all his godly ones. And again, we see closing here, praise the Lord. Now, I promised earlier that I wanted to come back to verse 1, um, and, and I do. Let's go ahead and do that now. Sing to the Lord a new song, uh, his praise in the assembly of the godly. So, the reason I love this statement so much, um, so I actually ran the, the math one time. You know, we find in the scriptures sort of a ballpark number of how many songs and poems, you know, David had actually written. And the math sort of works out. He wrote pretty much a new song just about every week of his uh, kingly reign, right? For, for 40 years, he wrote a new song. I mean, I don't know exactly when he kind of cranked them out. He, he probably could have done them all at the beginning and had some breaks in there, but it, it, it averages out to about one a week. Now, when we think about this, all of these are songs of praise. Why, why a new song? What was wrong with the old ones? You know, David wrote a lot of songs. What was wrong with the old ones? Well, there's nothing wrong with the old ones. But uh, what we find is that David seems to continually add to what he is uh, praising God for, or, or he's modifying what he is praising God for. And he reveals the truth that as we grow in our life, and as we grow in our Christian walk, we begin to know God better. And so, the God that you know today, that's not to say he changes, right? But our understanding grows, our understanding changes. And so the God that you know today, if you were to write down all of the wonderful things about him, by the time the sun sets, you will have learned more about him. And in your new understanding, God has become bigger than the God on the page that you just wrote. Now, again, God God does not change, but our understanding of who he is changes, and the way we may describe him will change. And so what we find is when David is talking about sing to the Lord a new song, he's talking about this continual growth that we have in our life. God is continually getting bigger and bigger and bigger, 
as we come to know him, as we come to experience him in our life, as we come to, uh, to walk through these dark valleys in life and, and see the victory that he claims through them, God becomes bigger. And because he is now bigger to us, he deserves a bigger song. He deserves a new song. And that's what I love about this expression. It's, it's, it's not a, you know, a thing saying that the old music is bad. It's saying that I know God in a new way today that I did not know yesterday. There is something new and fantastic about him. He is worthy of new praises and worthy of receiving new glory. And so we are always encouraged to sing to him a new song. And again, it says in the, in the assembly of the godly, we need to do this publicly uh, to, for the edification of believers. I'm going to put this up again so we can look at this uh, again together, just so we can see verse 1 there. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. We need to encourage one another by sharing what God is doing in our lives. Our testimony is powerful. Now, we understand that there are multiple testimonies in our life, right? Of course, we have our, our story of salvation, um, which is our, our greatest tool uh, in the sharing of the gospel. We see, again, Paul uses it. That's kind of his go-to over and over and over again. Um, because it's it's what's true to you, right? And I don't mean to say that you know what what the scriptures say alone is not true. That's not it at all. But you can speak from sure ground because you have walked that that path. You, when you speak your own t- salvation, the own your personal story of how you came to know the Savior, um, you're able to speak with absolute certainty because you have experienced that. If the only thing you have to go off of is uh, is the scriptures, even though we again we we affirm the absolute authority of the scriptures, you know you're you're relying on your understanding of the scriptures, and it may it may still feel a little unsteady. But if you're able to talk about your personal experience, uh, you know that's that's a story that can't be refuted because it happened to you, and it's a story that you know better than anyone else in this entire world, and so it's a powerful powerful tool for sharing uh, the mercy and the grace of the risen Savior that we know. You can tell exactly what he has done for you. But even after knowing him, he continues to bless us over and over and over. And so we have testimony upon testimony of the battles that God wins in our life. And we need to bring those before the assembly. We need to be constantly sharing what he has done. We need to be singing to him a new song so that he receives new glory. And we don't keep this to ourselves because if we keep it to yourself, you are denying him the glory that might come from those around, those that would rejoice with you. We're not alone in this fight. You have been blessed to be a part uh, of a a church family that I hope, and and I know I'm speaking uh, most likely to many of our own church family, but for those who uh, may be watching this that are not part of the Stillicum Community Church family, my prayer is that you are a part of a church family somewhere. And that you have a fellowship with other believers that you can share God's victories with, that he might receive glory from them as well, because he is worth it. He is deserving of all glory and praise that we can offer him. And so, uh, again, it is important that we share our testimonies, but not just so that he might receive glory from those uh, who love him. but We also share our testimonies in the dark times. We proclaim God's victory in the dark times that those who may look in that may not know him will see the victory that he wins and he'll be glorified in that moment as well. And it, it may bring some to faith. It may bring some to, to recognize the truth of Christ, the power of Christ. But for others, it may be this vengeance that we see mentioned here. And that glorifies God all the same. And so we sing to the Lord a new song. Tonight, I, we're, we're keeping it a little shorter, I guess, than, than others. This is a fairly uh, short psalm, and, and really the, uh, the central theme of this here is to continue to sing to him a new song. And so um, I just want to encourage you, really ask yourself, when is the last time that I uh, proclaimed in any way who God was to me or who God is to me? You know, perhaps if it was maybe today or more recently, you know, when's, when's, if you were to write down today who God is to you, if you were to look back in three months, is he the same or has he somehow grown because you know him better than you did? 
My challenge to you is if you can write down who God is to you today, and in three months you look back and he hasn't changed at all. Again, I'm not saying God changes, but I'm saying who we understand him to be does change because we know him better. And if so if in three months from now, our understanding of who he is has not grown, then I would ask you to consider whether or not you are experiencing him in your life. If you are challenging yourself to know him better, if you are seeking him in those difficult places, if you are praising him, uh, or if you're singing for joy, you know, on your bed, right, where we were kind of down and out, and we are crying out for joy, and we are, we are giving him glory as he gets us through those valleys, because I guarantee you, in three months, you're going to have some sort of difficulty, Really, I mean, you could say three days, but I, I'm using a, a bigger timetable here because sometimes we don't notice the incremental changes. And in three days, unless something dramatic happens, you may not notice uh, a, a dramatic change in your faith. But over the span of about three months, I imagine that you would. If we are truly seeking to understand God and to know Him for who He is, the more and more we seek to know Him, the bigger and bigger He will become to us. And again, God does not change. He is the same, but it is our understanding of him. Our knowledge of him will continue to grow. And because of that, he deserves a new song. So I want to encourage you uh, to, uh, to really seek that out. Would you join me as we pray here tonight? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, uh, Lord, giving you praise in all things. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy of all of our praises. And as we see uh, in this psalm, uh, we begin and end all things praising you. Lord, in the good times we praise you. In the bad times we praise you. Everything in between, uh, Lord, we give you praise in all things. And so I, I pray that you would help us to have that prayerful mindset, that mindset of praise. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would put a new song in our heart and on our lips. Um, Lord, as we come to know you better, Lord, you are worthy of a new song. Uh, you, we, you, you increase our understanding of your glory, and I pray that we would give that back to you in fullness. And uh, Lord, that we wouldn't just simply come to know you better, but that we would proclaim you more fully. And so uh, give us the boldness to speak your, uh, your blessings, uh, Lord, to speak your praises um, from our lips, Lord, not to be quiet and to hold them to ourselves, but to give you the glory uh, that you so rightly deserve. Lord, we ask that you would humble us, so that we can fully receive your blessings. Lord, we know that uh, we need to sort of get ourselves out of the way so that we can receive from you. And we truly recognize how much we receive from you and how fully we receive from you. Lord, we should be humbled. So we pray that you would just help us to stay humble, even though we, um, we, we continually receive your blessings. Uh, Lord, it is because you are good, not because we are good. And so we just pray that you would help us to keep a right understanding of all of that. Lord, we pray that you would give us boldness to proclaim our testimonies, whatever they may be. Uh, Lord, the testimony of our salvation, the testimony of other victories won uh, in our life, we pray that you would give us the boldness to proclaim them. Um, Lord, that they uh, be, be an opportunity, Lord, for you to reach into the lives of other people, that they may come to know you, or they may be convicted, uh, Lord, to see that uh, there, there are attacks against you, Lord, if they be ones that try to um, sort of discourage us or, or uh, you know, assault us in any way, um, Lord, to know that they haven't won, that you are the one who wins the victory. So, Lord, we just pray that you would give us that boldness. And Lord, we just ask all of these things, praying in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, church family, as always, um, praying a blessing over you over this next week. Pray again that God would bless you in a mighty way, that we could take his blessings, turn them back into songs, proclaim them for his glory, and then we would, above all, come to know him better and better with each day. I pray that we would write more songs than David. And then in the course of his life, he wrote thousands of songs. I pray that we could uh, just proclaim his glory each and every day in a new way because he is worth it. So I want to encourage you. Sing him a new song. And I'd love to hear it.
But until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And as always, I'll see you next week. Would you join me as we pray here tonight?